I present to you the next guest, Dr. Imad Rahim. Dr. Imad Rahim is an award-winning author, educator, entrepreneur, full by recipient, and a TEDx speaker. He was also authored Resilience from Killing Fields to Boardroom, which was actually an Amazon bestseller and co-authored The Inclusive Leader, an Applied Approach to Diversity, Change, and Management, and has contributed to Forbes, CEO Magazine, The Post Standard, and The Startup Magazine. He currently serves as the Co-Talk Family Endowed Professor and Chair at Bellevue University and operates a tech accelerator for BIPOC startup founders at Central State CEO in Tucker Q's. He serves as the former business dean at Claremont Lincoln University, Colorado Tech, and Steyer University. A fun fact about the very famous Dr. Imad Rahim is that he actually had no acting experience and did not take any acting classes or had any theater training. Yet, he was cast in a Sacre Q stage theater production called Tales from the Salt City, which was an extension of the acclaimed undersizable element series written by celebrity playwright and Presidential National Medal of Arts Award recipient, Ping Chong. This frightening yet anxiety-filled experience of being on the stage for four days out of a week for two months. I repeat, four days out of a week for two months. Wow, H how you did that, I don't know. <laughs> but because of that, with, him, with his training equity actors, it helped him establish his career as a professional speaker. Everybody, round of applause for Dr. Imad Rahim. Good evening, everybody. Now, there's a room full of technology people, and you can't give me no hair. Like, I, I was expecting, you know, some, some amazing AI technology used to improve this picture over here. Uh, first, thank you very much for um, allowing me the opportunity to come down here and speak to all of you. Um, and I would like to kick off this uh, speaking engagement with a story, right? So back in, I want to say, uh, you know the date? <laughs> um, around 2000 and, I want to say 2002, right? I was attending a community college. I was working two full-time jobs. I was a, a first-generation college student that was uh, being raised by a single parent. And I was struggling. Like, I was struggling really bad. I was placed on academic probation. I lost my EOP scholarship. And how many years you're supposed to be at a community college? Anybody? Five? It was about, it was about five. So I, I was, you're right on. So I don't feel so bad, right? So, so I had all these great things going to, you know, for me. And I worked a security guard shift, right? So I worked for this bank. And I used to do this overnight shift, right? So I used to work, I think it was like 11 p.m., and I got off at 7.30, and I had to catch public transportation to get back to the community college. And there was one class that I had to take, right? It was a human service class uh, by Professor Nicholas Poulos, and it was, a, it was like an 8 a.m. class, right? So, so I'm working all night, then I have to attend this class in the morning. So I was afraid to fall asleep, right? First day of class, afraid to fall asleep. So I figured that the smart thing to do is sit in front of the class, right? Sit right next to Nicholas Poulos because there's no way I would fall asleep, right? Two, three minutes in, I was knocked out. I was like, <laughs> gone. Now, I don't know how long I was sleeping, but there was like some spidey senses happening. Like something told me, Imad, you need to wake up. You need to wake up now. Something's happening around you. You should wake up, right? So I got up, and it's one of those like old tables where you're like stuck in your chair with the table. So I woke up, and there was a pile of drool that created like a waterfall off of my table and onto the floor, and there was a puddle. Right? It was n it was nasty. Believe me, it was nasty, right? So I got up wiped the drool off my face and probably most of my clothes, and I went towards the back of the classroom and went straight to sleep, right? The class ended, and I started walking out of the classroom, and my classmates stopped me. And they were like, Imad, did you know what happened in class? I was like, no, I was sleeping. They were like, 
you snored so loud that Nicholas had to stop his class. Not once, not twice, but three times. So I was like, okay, I'm not going back to this class. But then they said something amazing happened. Like he stood over me while I was snoring and drooling, and he pointed at me and shook his head. And I was thinking, okay, he, he probably is going to say this kid is messing up. He shouldn't be in my classroom. But he said this kid belongs here. Like he, he belongs here. Let him sleep. He's here. He doesn't have to be here. But he's here. Let's figure this out and let him sleep. So I felt guilty as hell. Right? Like this guy just like vouched for me. So I went looking for Nicholas Poulos. I, wa I went to apologize. Right, so I went looking for Nicholas, I found him, and I, I, I apologized. He's like, no, no, you don't need to apologize, but I need you to do me a favor. I need you to take a test for me. And I didn't even ask what test it was, because I was like, I felt so, so guilty. I was like, whatever test you want me to take, I'll take. Right? He's like, no, no, I just need you to take this test. I noticed something about your writing. Can you take this test? Right? So I took that test. And then that test turned to another test, and then another test, and another test. And then after about, I want to say two months, he called me in his office. And he sat me down, and he was like very calm, and he goes, Imad, I don't know how to tell you this, but you're dyslexic. And I'm like, how did I catch dyslexia? That sounds kind of nasty, right? So he goes, uh, do you know what dyslexia is? I was like, yeah, but I had no idea what that was, right? So he goes, well, you have a learning disability. I said, okay. I, I I, I know I have a learning disability. And he goes, no, no, this is a great thing, Imad. It's a great thing. We are able to diagnose you. And we know you're dyslexic. And I was thinking, like, how is this a good thing? You just told me I caught dyslexia, right? And he goes, no, no, Imad, this is great. Because now we know you could learn. You just learn different. And now we can figure out what the, res the type of resources you need and the type of support you need to improve your education and to improve your experience here on campus, right? And for the next semester, two, three, Nicholas became this amazing mentor, this amazing coach that pushed me forward, right? That took this kid that was at-risk student that lost my EOP scholarship, barely graduated high school to earn not one, not two, but three doctorates. Right? From fearing, from fearing, like, like really fearing education to becoming a dean at multiple universities. I still don't know how this happened, right? But a lot of it came from this level of support, right? This level of engagement. And the reason why I brought this story up is that there's all these checks and balances that were missed from high school to college. All these checks and balances, right? that all of these different departments were not communicating with each other. Like no one caught this. It took a professor five years <laughs> into a two years, into a two year program to catch this. Now imagine if the technology exists, and we know it exists, right? Imagine if there's a technology that, that existed when I went to school, right? Where I wrote my first essay to get into school. And that technology caught these, you know, these, 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 these clear indicators in my writing, right? And that technology basically communicated to admissions. And admissions caught that. And that technology communicated to them, right? And then instead of just accepting someone like me to school, they have the resources in place already, right? And those technologies will help communicate to the professors to make sure that they have access to the resource to help students like me, right? But right now, we know this technology exists, but many schools don't have it. We know that departments at large institutions, they don't communicate with each other. They work in silos, right? And I think end-to-end -end might be creating the solution that makes this communication possible. So I'm excited to see this technology and hear about this innovation, and like all of you, feel that this innovation could improve the quality of life for all of our students.
Thank you, everybody.